Hey everyone. These electromechanical watt hour meters are being replaced nowadays with digital counterparts. But there's actually quite a lot of interesting stuff going on inside there to make those work. So I thought we'd take a look today. So I have this set up with a digital watt meter in line and then I have a heater over here. So if I turn the heater on, you can see that the disc starts spinning in the watt meter. And I've got a digital meter here just so you can see exactly what it's drawing in real time. This is about 1200 watts. So let's start taking apart the meter and see what's inside there. The cover is marked line and load. And if we take this off, we can see that there's four terminals here. And I have it set up like this so that the neutrals are in the middle and the hots are on the outside here. And then this is a commercial power meter, so it actually has a little latch here. And so if you move the latch out, we can unscrew this glass top and have that come off. And you can see that there's actually six connections inside there, uh, which are connected in such a way that only four come out. And so let's uh, I'll unscrew all of this and then take the actual meter out. So here are the six power terminals that I mentioned earlier, and two of them are fairly small and go to this coil on the top, and four of them go to these coils on the bottom. So I'm going to take this off so we can see exactly what's going on with the coils. So imagine you were an engineer in the late 1800s, and your task was to design a power meter that could go on the side of someone's house and measure how much AC current they've consumed. So what we're actually measuring here are voltage and current when they are in phase together. One idea of how to do this is to use a separate coils for voltage and current and put them together in such a way that they interact and produce a force that is proportional to the power being consumed. So this, this design has been uh, virtually unchanged for about 100 years, which is pretty impressive for any sort of technology. So here's the basic design. We've got the voltage coil on the top and the current coil on the bottom. And this is what it looks like in sort of a schematic view where we have a voltage coil with a lot of turns and current coils with relatively few turns here. In the middle, this is the disc of the meter. And what we'll do is connect sort of an odometer to the disc so we can count how many times the disc has gone around and the amount of force generated by this magnetic arrangement here will be sort of accumulated over time so that we have a running total power usage meter. So the question becomes why have three coils in this arrangement here? Why not just have two like this or one offset or something like that? And the answer is that we need to have some physical offset from here to actually produce a net torque in the disk. So if you were in the lab just playing around and you had a, a coil, let's say we only had a voltage coil to start, and we plugged this into the AC line so that we had a nice uh, changing magnetic field coming out of that coil, and we brought it near the disk, it's true that that changing magnetic field would cause eddy currents to flow in the disk, uh, but no net torque would be produced because there's no reason for, that, for those eddy currents to be pushed. So every time that the magnetic field changes, uh, changes polarity, it's true that there will be eddy currents in the disk that are also changing polarity and opposing it, but the disk still won't really want to turn. So if we were uh, experimenting with this, we thought, well, maybe what we could do is put a current coil here and a voltage coil here, and that way uh, the magnetic field produced by the current will kind of interact with the voltage field, and that will kind of pull the disk around because we've got this offset. Not quite. Uh, it, it seems like that might work, but again, if the voltage and current are in phase, uh, there still won't be a net torque applied to the disk because the magnetic fields will both be varying exactly at the same time, and so there won't be any reason for the disk to turn. You can think about this kind of like the legs of a centipede, where if the creature just picked all of its legs up and then put them all back down at the same time, it really wouldn't go forward at all. It wouldn't even work to pick all of its legs up, move them forward, move them back, and then put them back down again. So coordinating all of its legs at the same time doesn't work. What we need to introduce is a phase shift so that, you know, in the centipede analogy, it would pick up some of its legs, move them forward, put them down, and then have this sort of traveling wave that moves through its legs, this coordinated movement. 
And what we're really talking about is a phase shift between the legs moving up and the legs moving forward. And that's exactly what, we're talk what we need to do here. So luckily for us, now that we're living in the age of AC current, there's an easy way to introduce a phase shift uh, with a magnetic, uh, with a coil system like this. And what we do is we just add a copper ring to this magnetic pole here. And that copper ring is right here in the actual device. So what happens is, is if the voltage coil is connected up to the line and we have current flowing through the coil, there will be a magnetic field induced by that current flow. Now instead of just coming straight out into the disk and inducing eddy currents there, the current or the, the magnetic field has to go through this copper ring. But the copper is a conductor and it's not connected to anything. It's just an isolated ring. So what happens is, is that magnetic field which is changing and going through that copper ring induces its own current in the copper ring. So this effectively consumes the change in magnetic field, but uh, the copper ring will also create a magnetic field. So what we have here is sort of a delay circuit. So the magnetic field can't just shoot straight through the copper ring. It has to induce a current in the copper first. And then uh, as that current dies down, we'll end up with a magnetic field caused by those uh, currents induced in the copper ring. So it's really just sort of a delay device. It's a 90 degree delay. So then you might wonder, why does this uh, copper coil uh, introduce a 90 degree phase change? Why is it not 180 or 42 or any other number? And the answer is that when the current flowing through this coil is at its maximum rate of change, then the magnetic field will be at its ma maximum value. And the reason for that is, so it's a law of nature. I mean, it's basically why sines and cosines are 90 degrees out of phase and all kinds of other good stuff. So basically what we've done with this 90 degree phase shift idea is create a uh, moving magnetic field just like the legs of a centipede that sort of pull the disc around like this. So we have these waves sort of undulating through here that cause the disc to move. It's similar as if I take this very strong magnet and just bring it near the disc like this and move the magnet around, you can see that it pulls the disc around because the eddy currents are so strong. So this moving magnetic field uh, causes the disc to turn because it's inducing current and then the, the magnet moves and uh, that current is then pulled toward the, the motion that I pull it, so it's in sync with the magnet. This arrangement of coils with the copper ring produces essentially the same thing. It's analogous to this, the same thing as uh, moving a, a permanent magnet along like this. This same principle is used in what are known as shaded pole motors. So this is a cheap motor that came out of a window fan or something like that. And if you look at it, it's got uh, iron to, to uh, channel the magnetics from the coil here into the rotor. But it also has these copper wires here. And as you can see, they're all just connected to each other. They're not connected to anything except uh, themselves. And, and they're even isolated from each other this way. So what these loops of wire do are introduce a 90 degree phase shift and that actually helps get the motor started. In this case, we only need that phase shift to get the rotor spinning. And once it's spinning in, a, in one direction, then the geometry of the motor will take over and, and produce torque. But when you first apply power to this, the motor doesn't know which way to go because the power is single phase. So these shaded poles produce a phase shift, which gives it that sort of centipede leg action to sort of push this thing around in the right direction. The term shaded pole just means that we've added a loop of wire to cause this phase shift to happen. So there's a couple other key bits to this meter. Now that we've applied a force to the disc that's proportional to the amount of power being consumed, we have to have some way of slowing it down too. So in our current system, with just this part, the disc would just spin faster and faster and faster until it, uh, it reached its mechanical uh, friction limit. I mean, it's we have nothing to actually oppose the motion that we're putting into it. So the way that we uh, slow it down in a controlled way is with permanent magnets. So these, these uh, large pieces of iron in the front here are, are permanent magnets, and they're set up so that they're, the gap is, um, the, the disc is in the gap. So as this spins, uh, those eddy currents are induced again and it will oppose the motion of the of the spinning. So as you can see there's very little tendency for this to turn after I let go. 
Lucky for us, the amount of braking applied with this system is proportional to the speed of the disc. So if we put the curve of, of torque produced by our power meter against the uh, opposing torque produced by this eddy current brake, we have a nice linear system that's very um, easily uh, set up to, to measure power like this. And you can see it's marked F and S for faster and slower. And what this screw does is it moves the magnet uh, in and out radially. So if it's further away, it will have more effect on the torque of the disc because it has a bigger lever arm. It's farther away from the, the uh, rotation axis. And if it's closer in, it'll have less of an effect. So the meter has a couple other interesting features. One problem is that the even though we've done our best to reduce the mechanical drag in this system, where we have you know a needle bearing and magnetic suspension and all that kind of stuff, there's still some magnetic drag that we need to overcome. And since our magnetic setup only produces torque when we have uh, you know the magnetic fields delayed when when the person's actually drawing power then we're not actually going to be charging them for the full amount because we're, we're giving up that mechanical drag. So the motor has this interesting bit of copper here, which uh, is asymmetric, like it's going in one direction on the disc. And I believe this is supposed to siphon off some of the magnetic field from the voltage coil and introduce an additional little phase delay so that there's always some torque on the motor. Essentially what we have here is the um, a shaded pole motor without any sort of current sensibility, basically just to produce some torque. But then we have the problem, what if a customer notices that their meter runs a little bit even when they're drawing zero power? That would be a problem for us too, at least legally. So what we do is we put a little hole here, and this is called the anti-creep hole. And when that hole comes around into the area where all these magnetics are going on, there's slightly less disk for it to operate on since there's a hole there, it's just air, and a, the hole won't turn through the, through the magnetic section. It will actually draw out a small amount of torque, and the disc will stop rotating when that hole comes around. So essentially what we have here is a system that compensates for mechanical drag and also doesn't overcharge the customer, or at most it will, char it will charge them for one rotation and then stop if they aren't using anything. And then, of course, we have this super high ratio reduction gear train so that all the rotations of the disc get um, divided down to very, very small rotations of the meters, on the dials on the front. I've also often wondered what that pattern is on the disc. There's sort of a stippling pattern uh, pressed into the aluminum disc, and I always thought, oh, that must have something to do with the eddy currents or whatever. But I think that's really just for, um, to make it easier to see the disc spinning or to make it more physically rigid or something. Also, this particular meter has an unusual current coil configuration. So it has one coil that is symmetric, and then another current coil that is asymmetric. So as you can see, there's kind of only one turn on this side, but there's actually a few turns on this side. And, you know, the line goes through this one, and the, or the neutral goes through the middle, and the hot goes through the outside. But I have absolutely no idea why you would want an asymmetric setup quite like that. Um, it might also be something to produce a very slight amount of torque in the static case just to overcome mechanical friction or something. But if you know, uh, please let me know because I can't, I haven't figured that out. Okay, see you next time. Bye.